Welcome to the context. In this episode, I want to share with you what I think is the way that we can train ourselves to be prepared for the unthinkable. Google searches, as you can verify on Google Trends, for unprecedented are spiking. So many things that we are surrounded by appear to be without precedent. And many of us would not have thought that our lives would be characterized by those things that are happening around us day after day. And in our situation currently, really the ability to open our minds and to prepare for scenarios that uh, may not have had a precedent or may not have been a commonplace thought is a great advantage. So what are the things that we think about? Obviously, we are creatures of habit. Our processes of thinking and our processes of doing things tend to repeat what we know. And there is a great advantage in that. As we exercise further the things that we know, we become better in them. And as a consequence, we tend to be rewarded for the reliability of repetitive tasks. However, we are also curious and we uh, explore what can also happen outside of the otherwise well-known path of experiences that we have already uh, completed. And this curiosity is exposing us to risk and that risk of course has to be balanced in order to survive uh, our curiosity as we are driven by these experiments that we do and also so that we accumulate knowledge that is somewhat connected to our past experiences as well. So these are some of the components and the parameters that we have to uh, keep in mind as we train ourselves to think the unthinkable. And of course it has already happened. There have already been things both in the recent past as well as farther down in history when radical changes took those who were unprepared completely uh, off their footing and those instead who maybe haven't been able to exactly uh, plan for what happened but they were nonetheless prepared to understand that radical changes were coming were able to le better leverage them. Some examples of these past changes can cover uh, social changes, civil rights, where it was fairly commonplace uh, to be racist. Even just uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago and uh, for some societies it is still fairly common to be racist and when society through uh, the, the the fights for civil rights reorganized itself to exclude racism as part of the normal civic discourse and uh, promoted the ability of uh, people of uh, different ethnicities and and what used to be called races uh, to achieve the same opportunities as uh, the previously privileged uh, races, the racists found themselves disadvantaged because their mindset was such that their ability to adapt was limited. And of course, disrobing the racist mindset was hard 
if not even impossible. A similar change in uh, our civil society happened with the uh, rights of uh, same-sex uh, couples. Homosexuals were uh, very heavily discriminated against and are still in some countries where being a homosexual uh, uh, is uh, an offense punished by the death penalty. But in the vast majority of the countries, the um, recognition that uh, homosexuals have the same rights as um, heterosexuals has been recognized and these rights have been implemented in the legal code and as a consequence people had to uh, overcome their prejudices if they had any in order to be able to interact in a manner that was conducive to constructive outcomes with regards to normal interactions in society but a society that changed and from their point of view changed quite radically maybe even unthinkably and in the past of course we had upheavals where the sanctity of a kingdom where literally the assumption was that the right of a monarch to rule descended directly from God was overhauled through a revolution. We still have uh, countries, even modern countries, uh, well-developed uh, Western democracies that are constitutional monarchies where uh, the, um, the head of state is also the head of the church and uh, rules uh, by divine uh, fiat. Not very dissimilar from how it was in the age of the pharaohs. But of course people, even in those monarchies, recognize that this is a little bit of a theater. Uh, if you go uh, to England and you ask a uh, hundred people do they believe that the queen rules by divine right probably 90 maybe 99 uh, out of a hundred will say no that that's not how I think about it but in the past that was the assumption and that is how the entire organization of the state uh, would be now today we have been thrust into an unthinkable situation and my reaction to the way that little by little various governments um, issue their updated predictions and their updated uh, rules regarding uh, the physical distancing of uh, uh, their residents uh, appears childish, condescending, and counterproductive. They are not entirely to blame because the electorate has been told that the elected are right, they are kept in a position where they cannot afford to be wrong, and as a consequence they have a very hard time admitting their ignorance. However, in this situation that would be the first to very constantly repeat and remark our knowledge about the nature of the pandemic is still very very limited. We don't know the exact origins of the virus. We don't know the exact mechanisms of the infection. We don't know the exact mechanisms and effects and uh, uh, 
uh, long-term effects, especially uh, of uh, uh, the um, COVID-19 illness. We don't know uh, the degree of uh, immunity that is or is not acquired as a consequence of falling ill and then healing from COVID-19. We don't know um, when a vaccine is going to be available, uh, the boisterous uh, declarations uh, notwithstanding that would pretend uh, uh, the vaccine to be available within a few months or at the end of the year at most. We don't know if a vaccine is going to be available. So rather than relying on the unreliable declarations of the local or central government of the country where you find yourself resident, whether you want it or not, because you are in lockdown and you cannot travel, exercise your freedom of thought. Exercise your creativity in planning scenarios for many of these variables in as a wide variety of combinations as possible in order to prepare yourself if one or the other of these combinations of parameters were to become true. Don't fear of being outrageous. Don't fear of being um, labeled uh, extremist or being labeled a, a promoter of conspiracy theories. The thought experiments that you will be running are essential for the mental health for what you need to prepare. Let me give you a few examples. Let's start with the origin of the virus. The official version is that it has spontaneously evolved hopping from species to species to um, evolve to the point where it could infect humans. Go to the complete extreme without falling prey to the trap of a mental model that has no alternatives. Just assume it as a working hypothesis or the plot of a thriller. Assume that the virus was designed and um, spread as a bioweapon. And then ask yourself, if that is the case, what is the world that you are living in today? For example, is this an optimal attack, a suboptimal attack? If it is suboptimal, a suboptimal, what is the definition of optimal? And will additional attacks also happen? Abandon that thought. Re-embrace the official definition of the source and the origin of the virus. Remember, this is just a thought experiment and it should be absolutely admissible to run these thought experiments. Let's take another parameter. Assume that the immunity actually is not developed because just as you don't develop immunity against the common cold and you can catch a cold which is um, caused by a coronavirus different from uh, SARS-2 COVID sorry I don't remember the code the name of the virus itself but with mechanisms that are able to trick our immune system not to develop the response that otherwise would be needed. So if COVID-19, even when you heal, does not give you the protection and you can be infected again, 
what is the type of world that you are living in or and the last example think the unthinkable that just as for the past 30 years we have not been able to design and produce a vaccine for HIV that causes AIDS potentially we will not be able to develop a vaccine for COVID-19 and what does that mean to live in a world like that in my opinion it is extremely important in order to establish an honest dialogue to start contemplating all of these scenarios as well as many others giving them weights and probabilities revising those weights and probabilities as time goes by and more information becomes available the more openly the more broadly we discuss about this the better we will be prepared if any of them rather than unthinkable becomes the reality that we objectively share and of course the pandemic itself with all its parameters all its variables is just one of many existential threats that we should keep our attention if not focused at least uh, periodically focused on for example we are still living in a world with thousands of nuclear warheads pointed at cities all over the world and uh, the annihilation of human civilization is only distant as a human error launching those missiles or a madman giving an order that is executed by obedient military chains of command so there are many of these threats and since you know now that threats that may seem far and detached from your everyday life have the ability of jolting you out of your comfort zone with very little or no foresight and and ability to to cope beforehand before the fact happens now you know that it is worth and necessary to think the unthinkable about the other scenarios as well